Right, so we move into another plenary discussion with short briefings. So if I can ask Bex, Katie, Lizzie and Lucy to take a seat along here and Graham will magic the place names. And so we'll interleave those contributions uh, in the course of a discussion or contributions and questions from, from across the room. We've just heard a very, very powerful um, uh, example, including a powerful example that cross-connects the uh, resources in the sector to great advantage around the user, as, as has been described. Um, one of the things connected through that scheme is, of course, the access to public funding where that is available. Uh, I wondered if anyone in the audience would want to pick up the, the legal aid point there. We've, we've got Kate and Chris from LAPG or Richard Miller from the Law Society. Who, who, would, who would like to chip in on that one? Yeah. Th uh, yes, thanks very much. Jane from Clock. Thanks. Um, so I, we have um, uh, signposted to um, flows from Clock, um, and you know we're really thankful um, for the initiative. I think the key legal aid point is to highlight that um, we're still in a, a realm of, of domestic violence being means tested, as well as merit tested, um, and we have a, a high number of litigants in person who have experienced serious allegations of domestic violence who are having to go through proceedings as litigants in person in children proceedings. So where there's, it's not for a non-molestation, but when it's in a separate children proceedings case. Um, and we have collated evidence with regard um, to um, the cases that we've assisted to inform the post-LASBO um, implementation review um, to see where it's possible to seek legal aid, where there's a significant risk of harm to children. Um, and just going back to the previous panel, um, just thinking about the local authority, we have many blurred cases where local authority cases um, of public care and the initiative of the SGO order as a private law application. We understand the Ministry of Justice has committed to put funding into SGOs. So I'd be very keen to learn from today to take back as to whether the SGO funding, when it's going to happen, because I understood it was going to happen in 2019-20, um, and understanding the child arrangements applications, we still have a huge gap and whether um, that evidence that we've submitted would be considered for legal aid in that situation. Jane, thank you very much. Would anyone like to follow? Yes, Janet. Microphone here. Am I switched on? Yes, I am. Um, first of all, I want to express my enormous admiration for the work that is going on. Uh, I only know really about the Access to Justice Foundation, but uh, I'm learning a lot more today, and I'm full of admiration for the work that is going on. The focus so far has been very much on process, and it's absolutely right that we should be improving process, both inside court and outside. But, and I, to my mind, it's a huge but, there is no substitute for legal advice. And I think we, this sector is in danger of accepting that there is never going to be any improvement in the legal aid position, that LASPO is never going to be put in reverse. And we must not accept that. And I urge every one of you to make clear, whenever you can, that you do not accept that the present situation with legal aid is acceptable in a democratic society based on the rule of law. So please, grumble. And have you noticed that we are in the middle of a horrible general election and civil justice is not an issue anywhere. And that's not right. So please, grumble. Thank you.
Thank you very much, J Janet. And thank um, you. Pen can you hear me? I'm Penelope yeah. Gibbs from Transform Justice. This may not be a popular point of view, but I, I just want to highlight the fact that there are some people who are, have been alleged to have committed domestic abuse, either in the criminal courts or the civil courts or the family courts, who in fact are not guilty of it and are found not guilty of it or the facts are not found. Those people have allegations against them and actually it's very difficult for those people to access legal aid and legal advice as well. Thank you very much. What I'm going to do is bring in, if I may, Katie to give us just four or five minutes on the work of Public Law Project in the area of exceptional case funding within the legal aid system. Katie? Thank you. Um, and actually that picks up nicely on the... Can you hear me all right? Um, so I just want to pick up on the access to public funding point that we've been talking about just now. Um, exceptional case funding is an important part of access to public funding. So the scheme was introduced by the government in response to concerns about the removal from scope of many areas of law by LASPA in 2013. And it's designed to act as a human rights safety net for individuals whose cases would be otherwise outside of the scope of legal aid, but whose rights would be breached if they didn't have access to legal representation. Um, during the passage of LASPO, the government made clear that the ECF scheme was designed to ensure that legal aid would remain available for cases in which people genuinely could not manage by themselves. Um, so, although take-up of the scheme is now gradually rising, um, it has been much lower than anticipated. So, over the last seven years, PLP has devoted our resources to trying to improve the accessibility of the scheme for individuals. Um, unlike in-scope legal aid, um, individuals with a legal problem that's outside the scope of legal aid can apply by themselves for funding, so they don't need a legal aid provider to be involved. Um, they can make an application by themselves or with support from the third sector or a pro bono organisation. Um, but the application process can be really difficult for an individual to navigate without any assistance, and legal aid providers often lack the capacity to help clients apply for ECF. The process of making applications can be very lengthy and is unfunded. Um, what I wanted to talk about briefly today is that that gap is now being met, um, in some cases, by a number of university law clinics and by commercial law firms who've set up ECF projects in order to assist individuals to make ECF applications. Successful applicants can then um, approach stretched legal aid providers with a ready-made grant of funding. Um, research carried out by PLP in 2018 found that pro bono ECF clinics can play a vital role in facilitating access to justice and ensuring that individuals are able to access the advice to which they're entitled. Um, they also offer law students and lawyer volunteers an opportunity to develop legal skills and increase their awareness of access to justice issues. So, building on that research, we've recently published, in collaboration with Freshfields, a guide for university clinics and pro bono departments on how to make ECF applications. Um, and we've carried out that work because we want to ensure that pro bono providers, the pro bono sector, are aware that the government has made provision for funding to be available in these out-of-scope cases um, to ensure that um, publicly funded advice is being utilised um, and that individuals are able to access legal aid before looking to other last resort resources. Thanks. Well, many thanks, K K Katie. I mean, one of the points that has come up even in the course of this morning is where there isn't, because of the way things have developed, um, a source of legal aid expertise in a particular part of the country. Um, and so that subject, uh, one of the challenges, if you like, um, sometimes about remoteness is very much with us. Would anyone like to come in on that? Um, I know, Eddie Coppinger, uh, you've been working on remote provision in the southwest. Give, give us a couple of sentences on that, if you would. We, we've uh, tried to engage with legal aid agency in terms of Cornwall and Dedham uh, with regard to perhaps co-production uh, so that uh, uh, we're able to tender 
the community organisations are able to tender for legal aid contracts known for well that they, they would meet the tender uh, specifications. Uh, that, that, that process has been painfully slow. I, I don't suppose it's been helped by you know, the present general election. Um, in terms of Cornwall and Devon, we're, we're active uh, in trying to set up uh, duty desks, family law duty desks, at, at, at the various courts. So there's two main courts in Cornwall, Truro and Bodmin, and there's four in Devon. We've got two live at the moment, so Truro and Bodmin's live, and we're actively trying to uh, get the four in Devon live very shortly. Many thanks. Anyone like to follow on from that? Judge, yes, thanks. Hello, Matthew Nicklin, High Court Judge. I'm on, and Deputy Lead on uh, Litigants in Person Liaison. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to ask about exceptional case funding, whether anybody has the statistics about how many applications are successful. So, um, as I said, take up of the scheme has been rising um, throughout the last seven years, and the uh, percentage of successful applications has also been rising. So, in immigration cases, the grant rate is currently above 75%. Um, so you've got pretty good um, chance of getting, getting funded if you make an ECF application in immigration cases. In other areas of law, the grant rate is much lower, unfortunately. Um, in family, I think it's around 25%. So one thing that we're really trying to encourage people to do is to make applications in other, area of laws, in other areas of law, um, and we're happy to kind of assist with those um, if that would be useful for providers. And if I don't cause too much by way of blush, a lot of that progress is down to PLP's endeavour. Paul, do come in. The mic from okay. the front. Can we Hello. Uh, the number of ECF grants started very low. It was under 100 in the first year. The majority of those were for inquests. And this year it was up to, I think, just shy of 2,000. Although that compares to 4,000 that were predicted as to be the number. So, still under half for those who didn't hear. That's part of the Ch ch challenge ahead in uh, um, uh, uh, conjunction with the LAA. I'm going to bring the next panel contribution in, if I may. And Alison, having spoken about the FLOWS project in the context of partnership within the LIP support strategy, bring us up to date, Bex, in four or five minutes about that. I was waiting for a cheer from outside, but it doesn't seem to be coming, so I'll, I'll plough on regardless. Um, the Litigant in Person Support Strategy, we're a national partnership of organisations working together with the Ministry of Justice to improve the experience of litigants in person. Just by way of brief reminder, we've got six core partners, the four main recipients of funding being Support Through Court, RCJ Advice, Lawworks and Law for Life, and two other organisations with a strategic role in supporting litigants in person. So that's the Access to Justice Foundation and Advocate. You've already heard from RCJ Advice and you're shortly going to hear from Lizzie. So I thought I'd just briefly focus on some of the other work we've been doing to support litigants in person. So inevitably, a bit of a quick gallop through. So Advice Now is the one-stop shop website for litigants in person. And they've been developing new resources, including a survival guide to benefit sanctions, what to do if you're threatened with homelessness, and there's been a 16% increase of page views. And when you look at who's actually using the site and materials, well, 85% of users are identifying as potential or actual litigants in person, and the resources continue to reach vulnerable people. Of those surveyed, 58% of users identified as disabled, and 48% report a household income of less than £1,100 a month. Excitingly, now in partnership with Resolution, Law for Life have now developed a pathway to affordable legal advice. This is going to pioneer new ways of working to support separating families who can't afford the traditional end-to-end -end legal help by providing quality self-help information and expert fixed-fee legal advice which will appear as offers at various points in your um, progress through Advice Now and the pilot launched just in November. Coming on to LawWorks, well, over a one-year period, 48,000 people received free legal advice and information through 10,300 volunteers in the LawWorks Clinics Network. There are now 280 pro bono clinics across the country, including 20 which opened in the last six months alone, and that included a new clinic for people experiencing homelessness in Cardiff. And really crucially to support this, alongside the actual provision of advice and the volunteers, is nearly 50 training sessions and webinars, 
which had been delivered around the country. And over 100 stakeholders attended the National Clinics Conference in June to share good practice, exchange ideas and the like. Then coming on to advocate, this is where we bring the barristers into the picture. Well, they've provided 725 pieces of pro bono legal work so far this year, including advice and representation up to the Court of Appeal. And this year, they're really trying to focus on increasing the panel of volunteers they've got available. And in the first recruitment round for senior reviewing barristers who decide whether cases are eligible for help or not, 50 senior reviewing barristers joined the panel in just over three weeks, so the willingness is there still to get involved. They're beginning to work with the Inns of Court, advocate to make sure that pro bono is included in the, tra included in the training programme where relevant. And I also think what's interesting is Lizzie, with support through court, goes and occasionally speaks to some of the pupils or um, younger barristers about litigants in person, really noticing a shift in the way people are perceiving litigants in person, which is really positive. And finally, last year, we mentioned um, briefly mental health. And through the LIP network, we continued trying to develop the conversation in this area around how we try and help distress litigants in person. So in April, we hosted a roundtable for the North East advice sector and social care sectors, identifying shared concerns around the impact of non-advice service closures, which therefore impacts on all of us here, and particularly people on the front line. We also developed our, sec our third workshop around actually aiming at judiciary, court staff, advice sector around practical details of what you can do to try and help people in distress, which we'll see increasing numbers of. And as Les said, we're going to be repeating that in Belfast in February. So for next steps, well, earlier this year, as part of the MOJ's action plan, they announced um, some additional funding over the next two years to enhance legal support for litigants in person. The grant aims to enhance services that support the earliest possible intervention, which we've heard a lot about today. Developing our understanding of how and when litigants in person access different services, and really importantly, again as we've heard today, building an evidence base of what does and what doesn't work. At the moment, we're working closely with the MOJ legal support team, obviously can't be on the platform alongside us, but on the new arrangements, including looking at the evaluation framework, governance arrangements, etc. And the final thing, Robin, if I can just grab one last minute. Just, I think it's really important, it builds on what Alison said, just to really provide the voice of litigants in person in this room. So yesterday I was in um, Ireland, uh, in Dublin, at an event on assisting litigants in person facing home possession. Instead of a traditional conference format, I was inquiries. The idea was hearing from different um, perspectives. So I was talking about how we, what programmes we have in England and Wales, and there was a judge from New York. But a third of people there were litigants in person. They were all facing possession of their homes, and I just wanted to share their voice with you. I know you know this, but sometimes I think it's just missing. They said, they remarked, legal language often talks about equity, it talks about property, it doesn't talk about their homes. They talked about the real sense of shame. They don't want to be at court, they'd rather be at home, they'd rather be working. There was a man who very generously shared his story called Jerry, who'd received a letter telling him to hand over the keys to his home on Christmas Eve. And after, oh dear, I'm so sorry, I didn't realise this would happen. And afterwards, he went into a shed to hang himself. And he didn't, and he's lost friends over the past 10 years. I think this is why I wanted to do it today, to risk saying this here, because I think we don't hear it often enough. It shows I don't, because I'm now all over the place. <laughs> so it's a perfect time to hand over, with much embarrassment, but I think it's important. So there we go. And every credit to Northern Ireland for the leadership in uh, uh, that type of ga gathering. Um, I have had the same um, e experience over there as well. Um, the other theme that was in Alison's and Paul's presentation, of course, was that the area of vulnerability that is experienced by women, and we've got Dr. Amra Bone just towards the back, and I, I wonder, with your experience of engaging with vulnerable women in the Muslim community, would you add a few sentences? Um, ab absolutely. We get a lot of women who um, have experienced um, domestic violence to um, um, just sort of funding issues that they... Um, they come to, to us in the Sharia Council to 
to initiate the process because they can't afford to go to the civil courts. Many of them do that because they don't want to be in the same situation for any longer. Um, they desperately need a lot of help, but we at least try to help them so that it, at least from the Islamic perspective, the man, well, hopefully would feel that he doesn't have any right over her. So um, we try and help as much as we can, but I wish we had the um, sources or the resources uh, that we could put people forward to. Um, I've heard quite a lot here, which is very helpful, and I would like to have some sort of um, link that we can provide these women, um, but because the majority of these women just don't have any um, understanding of their own legal rights, um, where they could sort of go for help, and uh, they come to us, and I wish we could provide them with that. So thank you very much for giving us all the information that you have today, and I hope I can build some links here so that we can provide those women who feel so helpless to, to give them some help and information. Thank you very, thank you. Thank you very much. Would someone like to come in next? Yes, thanks very much. Um, Clara Skirvankwa from Trust for London. We are an independent charitable foundation and we fund quite a few people in the room. We fund a lot in um, legal advice and, and advice in general. And thank you, Rebecca, for, for sharing your experience because that's something that has been going through my mind since the morning. As a trust, we invest and support quite a lot of work that is focusing on working with experts by experience and having experts by experience lead processes of reform and looking for solutions. And I wonder whether there are areas of learning for a lot of the, lot of the work that we've been discussing since the morning around actually having those that have experienced situations leading some of those processes to avoid some of the mistakes of the past where you design something that's, that's well-meaning but actually doesn't work for the people yeah. who need it. Yeah. Well, if I may bring in um, Sydney Kingsmill, just on this point, which if, if this is acceptable, that's the reach by HMCTS towards the user experience. <laughs> So I can't really say much, obviously, as being a civil servant in the but, um, you know, I think it's incredibly important to design services uh, with the user front and foremost, because otherwise, I and mean, then just picking up on what you said, otherwise we genuinely continue to design stuff that we think is important, um, but actually doesn't really work perfectly well. And we've certainly experienced that um, a fair bit over the past four years of HMCTS reform where we think we know what we're doing and then you go and talk to users and they say that's very nice but actually pivot a bit over here um, and one of the principles of reform looking backwards has always been to start to redesign the court and tribunal system from the point of view of the user um, and obviously there's still a long way to go over the next few years as well. Thanks so much, thanks so much. I'm very grateful to um, S S Sydney for being able to make a careful intervention there. Well, let's look across the panel to another of the LIP support strategy partners um, and one of the partners uh, alongside the others who are in touch with the user every day. L Lizzie, thank you for standing in at the last moment, Eileen being indisposed. Over to you for four or five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so let's just pick up first on the language, use of language. Um, I speak to the pupils on their training course at Middle Temple about litigants in person, and I remember after LASPO when a whole heap of manuals came out uh, for litigants in, person, litigants in person, written by lawyers. Uh, I think we've moved on from that, but if you think that the most basic terms in the legal industry are filing and serving... Filing is what I do with pieces of paper when I put them in alphabetical order, and serving is what happens in a restaurant. There is such an underestimation, I think, of the impact of the court service on people trying to represent themselves. And we've already had reference to uh, perfectly intelligent, capable, leading people in high-powered jobs who crumble when they get to court. 
So I think we really have to remember just how far below the average capacity many, many people are when they're in crisis in court. So let's just put a marker for that one. Uh, so, yes, the personal support unit rebranded a couple of months ago. We are now a support through court, which I think says what we do on the tin, uh, better than the previous title. Um, and the theme of these fora is relentless positivity. You will hear a positive story in a couple of minutes, but I want to flag up really the elephant in the room. We've talked about access for individuals to public funding, but support through court is going through a restructure and there will be a positive outcome at the end of it. But we wouldn't be doing it if we didn't have a funding gap. No charity cuts services for needy beneficiaries unless they absolutely have to. We will probably reach out to about 700 fewer contacts per month in the short term because of this restructure. We're not the first charity to restructure, we won't be the last, and we will come out stronger at the end of it. But we're cutting three services, we're reducing three in the hours that we're providing to litigants in person, and we have rescued a service at West London Family Court because of the sheer fight of the manager and the dedication of the volunteers who are going to run it without management supervision for us. And because they feel so strongly about the clients who will be left without support. So I think it is an elephant in the room and I think we have to acknowledge it because if we don't say it, then everything will go along swimmingly and more and more services will try to deliver on air and we can't go on doing it. Okay, let's get to the positive. Um, we've reviewed our management structure. We will invest in our fundraising team and we will devise an ambitious new fundraising strategy in order to pull in the money that we need, not just to recover to the footprint that we were at before, but hopefully to go on expanding and reaching into more courts and reaching more of the demand from litigants in person for the kind of procedural help that we can give. We don't give legal advice, we're not a substitute for lawyers, and we're very keen to work with pro bono providers to get clients to legal advice. But we can do a lot of the process around that advice. And as I mentioned briefly in response to Peter's inquiry earlier, if we've got a synergy of services, we can get clients from one service to another and make sure they're getting that joined up provision and targeting the specialist services to help them through their journey. And that's one of the things that we should constantly aim at. We've had discrete MOJ money this year for a project working with survivors of domestic abuse. And again, that's been a combined piece of work. It's highlighted for us, I think, again, which has been mentioned in the room already, but is worth underlining, the invisible and deep impact of domestic abuse. And again, the recognition that when people come into court, mainly women, but also men, who have been victims of domestic abuse, their experience is not seen. And we had, again, a powerful testament from an individual at our domestic abuse conference in November, who said, if I present as confident and capable, nobody sees the suffering. If I present in tears, I'm considered a weak and feeble woman. So our piece of work on domestic abuse has really highlighted for us some of the things that we need to be more aware of. And I'm actually very keen that we could try and use a similar model for people going through the court system with mental health issues, because again, we all know just how much that has increased and how many of us are trying to deal with mental health issues without the proper training and the proper backgrounds. So again, I think a piece of work with the MOJ around that would be fantastic for future planning. Um, the other thing that we're very pleased about is that we've secured funding for a national phone line. Phone service isn't 
A substitute face-to-face -face services, um, we need to continue helping people on the ground, but it will fill in some gaps. And as also mentioned, there's real value for different client groups. And we know from the pilots that we did earlier this year that actually there are a lot of people that can't get to our services face-to-face, -face, that struggle to get off work or to leave their homes. And a telephone service is a fantastic extra facility. And we've got the funding to do that. We'll be recruiting in January, and we're very keen to get that going. And we thank Birmingham City University for helping us with a site, a bank of phones, and some financial funding as well. Thanks, Lizzie. We're going to have to draw that to All right. an end. Well, I would just confirm that we do work very closely with the other partners in the Lizzie Interperson strategy. Um, we refer to flows. We constantly refer people to the fabulous resources on Advice Now, and um, our Exeter office did some work with ECF funding in the Southwest. And I will finish, please, with a tribute to the nearly 800 volunteers that deliver the service for us. We're only in 10% of the courts, but those 800 people make a huge difference to 75,000 people last year, and we hope very much that our restructure will enable us to continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie, um, and we hope that very much in, uh, indeed. Um, I'm grateful to Lizzie for reinforcing the partnership that's in operation here. Richard Leeper chairs the advisory board for the LIP support strategy partnership. Richard, do you want to say something? What, what, what we've heard about the um, strategy today I think represents what's going on in this forum. The cross-fertilization of ideas, of experiences that people get, and to answer the point that the, one of the litigants in person we've actually heard from today, we, hear, we do hear a lot about trying in this forum, and that's because if we hear about what other people have tried, we can learn from that experience, and we're not always reinventing the wheel, which I think is is a real risk if everyone is atomized. And, and this forum and the strategy pull all of that together in a very valuable way. Richard, thank you very much. Now, nobody, I think, uh, is unaware of the number of people that are on legal walks these days up and down the country. And of course, it was London Legal Support Trust that started that initiative. And the scale of the walk in London is just inspiring. So, Neza had a couple of sentences from LLST. Thank you, Robin. As, as you said, uh, we're all trying our best to help uh, people who need help, and our walk is just a tiny part of what everybody else is uh, doing. So, this year we uh, had 15,000 people, and these are the barristers, lawyers, uh, legal uh, sector uh, professionals, from administrators uh, to volunteers, and non-legal uh, people who joined our walk. Uh, so 15,000 people walked. Uh, it is a brilliant, brilliant event. It is one of the probably the biggest event in legal calendar. The next year walk is on 18th, 8th, 8th of June, if you haven't heard and you haven't received anything. I'm sure uh, Bob Nightingale and uh, Philippa Higgs will be emailing you soon. But if you haven't, please do come and join us. We raised £890,000 this year, uh, over £890,000. It was £893,000 yesterday, and it's still going up. So thank you very much for all the, uh, who have joined us. And if you haven't, please do look uh, up for us, and then come and join on 8th of June. Thank you. And of course, those, those walks are happening across the country. And the other thing that they bring, like this room, is cross-connections, new connections, sharing of ideas, identifying the ones worth running with, and putting to one side the ones that, that don't. We need every one of those good ideas. Again, if they bundle together, uh, the total is uh, impressive. But those walks have extended internationally as well. The example has been picked up in various parts of the world and is increasing. 
Um, and I wondered if in that vein we could turn to our next and final contributor of short bri briefing and Lu Lucy, co-chair of the IBA's Access to Justice Committee uh, is going to speak about a, a report from uh, them and the World Bank that takes a quite important angle on legal aid. Lucy. Thanks very much, Robin. <clears throat> Can I first say, in case you've noticed in the programme that I'm apparently a QC, unfortunately I'm not. Um, if anyone wants to make me a QC, I'm willing. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's, it's great to be talking now because, of course, so many people have been saying things that, that I, can, I can then build on. And actually, Janet's contribution at the beginning of this session about let's not forget about legal aid is one that I hope to address. Um, as we all know, and as has been a, a stream of, of conversation through here, access to justice is an essential element of the rule of law. Um, and as such... Um, because the rule of law is the responsibility of government, access to justice is the responsibility of government. Um, and as we also know, um, although legal aid isn't the only way to provide access to justice, it's a, an accepted and reliable way of doing so for those who need a lawyer but can't pay for one. Um, one of the brick walls that many of us have been banging our heads against for many years is the bland assertion that as a country we cannot afford uh, comprehensive legal aid. You know, we're going through a crisis, sorry, we can't afford to spend the money. And even when we show that that is not the case, we're not believed. Um, well, now we have good evidence that legal aid is as important for economic growth as providing hospitals, schools, and roads. Um, in September of this year, the IBA, International Bar Association, and the World Bank published a report on the economic benefits of legal aid. The IBA is simply a gathering of lawyers across the world. Um, it has no uh, uh, sort of governmental status or anything of that nature. Um, the uh, World Bank is funded by many governments um, to eliminate poverty and support sustainable development, and it is trusted by governments for its financial and economic analyses, so it was hugely valuable that we had the World Bank on board doing this work with us. Um, and the report shows, by way of cost-benefit analysis, that countries across the world, Africa, Europe, Asia, North America, Australia, um, in those countries, legal aid not only helps individuals, but also benefits the societies in which those individuals live and contributes to economic growth. Um, and it, 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 it sets out the evidence uh, that legal aid is as fundamental to economic growth as healthcare and education. Um, not providing legal aid does not save money. The cost of problems unresolved by a lack of legal aid simply shift to other areas of government spending, such as healthcare, housing, child protection, imprisonment. Um, but it's more than that the cost of unresolved legal problems can also affect local communities. Uh, failing to challenge incorrect welfare benefits decisions, failure to challenge housing disrepair or repossession proceedings, failing to support families in trouble, results in poorer, shabbier, less stable communities, which affect everyone who lives in them, whether they're rich or poor. So now, what we have, alongside the principled arguments for legal aid, which are obviously the major arguments for legal aid, we also have an economic argument, um, which we can address not only to um, policymakers and decision makers, but also to the public, um, to make the point that legal aid benefits all of us in very direct and immediate ways, um, whether or not we are the recipients of it. Um, the report not only provides this evidence, and I will give you the link in a minute, uh, but it also provides a tool on how to carry out your own cost-benefit analysis. And to take an example, which is given in the report, but I'm picking up on what people have said today, um, this tool would allow um, reasonably intelligent people, probably um, with the assistance of someone with economic, um, an economist, um, to um, do a cost-benefit analysis comparing um, an area in the country where there is no housing legal aid provision 
with another area in the country where there is housing legal aid provision. And in one area, you'd be able to show, well, the cost of housing legal aid is X, and the benefit is probably X times something. In the other area, it would just be um, the, uh, the cost of not having legal aid. And so you can, you can make very direct comparisons and this, I think, helps all of us to make the case that legal aid, in some form or another, needs to be reintroduced. Um, I said I was going to give you the link. I'm not actually going to read out a link because that's too complicated. But if you go to International Bar Association, Access to Justice and Legal Aid Committee, it's all there um, on, on the web page. Uh, that's all I'm going to say, except for one personal plea. Some people in this room talk about legal aid. Some people talk about public funding. Public funding was an expression brought in by a previous government um, to tilt public opinion away from legal aid. The idea being, well, it's publicly funded and therefore it's taxpayer funded and therefore we have to be much more careful. You shouldn't, I don't think you should use the term publicly funded when you, when you mean legal aid because what about the Crown Prosecution Service? That's publicly funded. What about the Government Legal Service? That's publicly funded. What about all the uh, lawyers across government? They're publicly funded. Let's not blur what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is legal aid. Lots and lots of lawyers are publicly funded, and hurrah for that, because lawyers are a very worthwhile group of people to receive funding. But let's not blur the lines between different sorts of uh, public funding. Legal aid is legal aid. Thank you. I suppose just uh, in the spirit of debate, um, one way of using the, the, um, those words, public and funding, is funding for the public. Funding for the public, because fundamentally, what we're about is trying to make sure that something reaches the public, is available to, is accessible to those who need it. Um, but in the spirit of the, the person that matters is the person that we're, we're all striving to do our very best to uh, um, assist. A number of references have been made to the importance of those basic points. This comes up each year and it's important to reinforce it. There have been improvements, but to reinforce it. The language and the accessibility of materials. And so can I ask perhaps first uh, Lisa Wintersteiger from at Law for Life, and then perhaps Sophie from Just Access uh, to speak a couple of, couple of sentences each on language and on accessibility of materials. Yes, it's something we continue to work very hard on. I was pleased, although it's not yet in, in the public domain, to see the new legal needs study, which uh, was jointly funded by the Law Society and uh, the Legal Services Board, again picking up on those broad issues that we know are still such a challenge, uh, not just knowledge, but also people's skills, um, and the confidence to access those, those materials. So something that we work quite hard on is um, ensuring that, uh, that uh, alongside the language, that people are encouraged to make their way through those materials, and also to deal with the kind of clusters of issues that people have. But it continues to be an, an enormous problem. Um, in terms of the breadth of challenge uh, for knowledge. Thank you very much. Sophie, you're happy to come in. Hello, I'm Sophie Walker. I'm the CEO of Just Access. We're a social enterprise technology company, which essentially means we like doing things the hard way. Um, we are trying to develop technology um, with a focus on low-income litigants and litigants in person. My obsession, or obsession for the last year, has been the real difficulties in accessing court judgments. Um, now, we all know we have Bailey, but since 2014, there have been thousands and thousands less judgments published each year. Now, there's a whole set of really complicated reasons as to why that is. Um, but for all the reasons why we should praise legislation.gov.uk, and my God, their new tool where you can look at, you can do a um, chronology and see what, the, what, the, what law was in place at a particular year is phenomenal and has now been adopted by LexisNexis and Thomson Reuters, so good on legislation.gov.uk. Bailey's, Bailey currently, Bailey currently gets 
£50,000 a year from the government to run. And with a bit of fundraising, it doubles that. But it is running on a shoestring. And a consequence of that is that legal information, even legal information pertaining to people's own cases, is increasingly unavailable. And that's an access to justice problem. But it's also an open justice problem, because that's our law. That's our information, and it's being lost. And it's being lost because it's being able to fall through the cracks because of a lot of private, quite uh, um, profit-laden profit companies who are currently taking a real swipe out of the, the cost that it takes to create those judgments and create those transcripts. So what we've been trying to do is develop technology to radically reduce the cost of producing a court transcript and to try and make those judgments much more accessible and when they're in the public domain. In the way that of Dr. Byron's talk, we need to look at this information as HTML rather than by allowing that data to be locked in PDF. Now, I know I'm being told off. I can see that I've, I've been taking too long. But I would be really keen to collaborate on this. It's been a bit of a lonely journey this last year. Um, and I know that your beneficiaries would benefit from understanding more about case law. If there's any ways that we can work together over the next 12 months uh, to make the next 12 months slightly less lonely, I'd appreciate it. Thanks very much. That's, that's the spirit, <laughs> in, including in that sense of uh, asking ourselves today, what can we take forward in the next 12 months? What are we going to be able to share when we reconvene in 12 months' time? Which partners that we've met perhaps for the first time today can we join with to, to progress as best, uh, as best we can? Um, can I just check, T Terry Smith, do you want to come in for a sentence or two? Uh, Terry is the head of portfolio impact and change at the Judicial Office, and I, th I think it's, it's, it's valuable just to uh, identify <laughs> Terry, but add a sentence or two so we can see what, you're, what you have to say as well. Certainly, thank you, Robin. Um, so I'm with Judicial Office on the Portfolio Impact and Change, but I support Lord Justice Fulford in his work around data and, again, working with Natalie on open sharing and data and its uses out there. So um, if anybody wants to get in contact, please do. Thank you so much. A last word or two from anyone. Anyone else like to come in? Graham, thank you very much. Um, I, I just want to pick up on something that Lizzie was saying about the language we use in uh, our court documents. I'm Graham Robinson. I'm a designated civil judge in Sheffield. Uh, I know most of my judicial colleagues here are on message, but maybe we ought to take back to our court centres everything that Lizzie said about file and serve. The other one is bundles. For most litigants in person, a bundle is a collection of services you get with your Sky subscription or your telephone. They don't think of it as, as documents. We shouldn't be using file and serve. We should be using send. We should try and make our orders in plain language. I know that most of my judicial colleagues in this room do, but can we try and take the message back? And maybe the rules committee might have something to say about it. Many thanks, Graham. There was a contribution here. Yes, Barry. It's an observation and a request for help. And it picks up on two themes that we've been discussing this morning. In terms of victims uh, of domestic abuse, the Domestic Abuse Bill, which both major parties have said that they will enact, prescribes within it that if you have a, a person who has been charged, cautioned or convicted of an offence of abuse, they will not be able to cross-examine the person who's been a victim, regardless of what the subject matter of the proceedings are. We uh, are considering whether or not that should be brought across to the civil jurisdiction. But there is a problem. And the problem is this. The person who is the victim doesn't have, very often, any legal assistance. And the practical effect of it will be that in court, the person who is the victim will be alone, and the person who has effectively been the abuser will actually have someone who will assist them in asking their questions. And we don't know the answer to that. It seems the most unfortunate uh, effect of the law of intended, unintended consequences. Uh, it seems to us 
it's going to be very difficult to ask in any report for legal aid to be restored within the civil jurisdiction. But at the same time, we have to reflect that the movement is in favour of preventing people who have been convicted or cautioned of an offence from cross-examining. Any help? Any ideas? Then I'll Thanks. be very grateful to hear them. In particular, Barry will be very grateful to hear those in the breakout session that he co-chairs uh, this, this afternoon. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll um, f finish the um, plenary discussion at this point. Um, and just before we break for lunch, uh, a, an opportunity for a brief update, as you see in the program. And I'll ask Martin Barnes, if I may, to join me uh, for this on uh, consulting with the sector on a centre for access to justice for England and Wales. But as Martin comes up, can we say thanks to our four contributors? <laughs>